Thank you very much for that, for that generous introduction. Um, it's a pleasure and a, such an honor to speak to you. For me, this institute is the institute above all others. Um, I was trying to explain to somebody the other day, I, I just said, you know, it's been just such an important time. And she said, well, you know, what, in what way? And I, I realized, I thought about it for a while, and then I realized you come here with all of your ideas, and 90% of them are, are bad ideas. But somehow walking around here and contemplating who has been here and so forth, the, the atmosphere kind of burns away all of your all of your bad ideas. So you're left maybe with not so much, but with something maybe reasonable. Right? OK, so um, I, I, will, I will start. An earthquake took place in mathematics in the 19th century, a shift in thinking which resulted in a great expansion of method and a splitting of mathematics into two parts, pure and applied by which I mean the ideal and the intuitively grounded. The rise of what we now call pure mathematics, the acceptance on the part of mathematicians of new concepts which had no direct physical meaning, is the story of how mathematics completed a centuries-long process of severing itself from its empirical roots. It is a long and complicated story and today, pure and applied mathematics are in practice so entangled that no sharp line can separate them. So I will just mention this. What I will actually talk about is the fallout from this earthquake in the early 20th century, the so-called Grundlagenstreit that followed from this, or in other words, the argument over so-called foundations of mathematics. But before I talk about the Grundlagenstreit, what was mathematics like prior to this transformation. If one looks at, say, the 17th century, mathematicians were largely concerned with empirical applications. The Empir word empirical comes from the Greek word for experience. There is a complex history behind all this. For example, the so-called infinitistic methods developed by Newton in the 17th century revolutionized the subject Nevertheless, as compared to the present, mathematics in the 17th century was very close to being a branch of empirical science. Whereas in the 19th century, what happened was that mathematics became flooded with abstraction. The idea of three-dimensional space, for example, gave way to the concept of an n-dimensional space for an arbitrary number n. So four-dimensional space, five-dimensional, infinite-dimensional space, and so on. The concept of number was generalized. And then there was the case of Euclidean geometry. It was invented in the 18th century, but it only gained acceptance in the latter part of the 19th century once the shift from empirical practice to a practice which viewed abstraction as a theoretical ideal had already taken place. So in Euclidean geometry, parallel lines do not meet the so-called parallel axiom. Uh, but in non-Euclidean geometry, and there are, there are a couple of them, parallel lines are allowed to, to meet. So mathematics in the 19th century underwent a period of tremendous growth in the direction of what we call pure mathematics. So that's, that's the good news. But at the same time, something very interesting, right? So there's a, something very interesting started to happen. And that is that certain notable failures of intuition occurred, which is just a fancy way of staying, saying mistakes were made. One form that this took was that what seemed to be very ordinary, uh, very harmless concepts admitted wildly pathological examples. One of the most important developments of this kind, so not a mistake at all, but a firm step into the territory where experience or our intuition fails us was the isolation of the concept of infinity. Originally, it seems to have been a theological concept more than anything else, so not really on the mathematical horizon. Or if it was on the horizon, it would not have been thought of as amenable to mathematical analysis. 
But in, in the 1870s, Georg Cantor in Halle, Germany, developed an exact mathematical theory of the infinite. He did this by extending the, the concept of counting so that one can count infinite sets with infinite numbers, numbers which can then be added and multiplied, extending arithmetic, the arithmetic of the counting numbers, into the transfinite or the actual infinite. It's interesting that he was working, and I guess this happens very often, he was working in a completely different area of mathematics, so the whole thing was an accident. The resistance to Cantor's work, so to the concept of an actual infinite, was virulent. The idea that one could count an infinite set struck mathematicians as preposterous. Isn't it the essence of an infinite set that as soon as you think you've counted everything, well, it's infinite, so there's going to be something else you haven't counted. In fact, the uh, resistance to the actual infinite is, is very old, uh, going back to Aristotle, but um, certainly many philosophers since took that, took that view, this sort of suspicion of, of the infinite. William of Ockham, Ockham, Aquinas, empiricists, philosophers like Locke, and so on. The view has many supporters even today. I mentioned that Cantor's contemporaries felt quite strongly about this. So in an initial salvo in what was to become a lifelong feud between the two of them, Cantor was accused of corrupting young people, actually of, of many other things, by, by Leopold Kronecker, who declared famously that God created the integers, all else is the work of man. And in fact, the theologians got very uh, worked up about what, what Cantor had done, this exact mathematical theory of the infinite. So the idea was the only infinite thing is God, anything, anything made by human beings. This cannot be the infinite. So what was the, what's the charitable view or the reasonable view at the time was that any reference to infinity in, mathematical, in, in mathematics is, is just a sort of way of speaking that could be paraphrased away. The use of infinitary concepts, this is just a matter of efficiency, but right, we don't, when we think of the set 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, the natural numbers, right, the idea there is just, it's infinite in the potential sense that if you give me a number from that set, I can give you a bigger number and so on, right? There's no object corresponding to that, to that set. Well, this is, this, is what, this is what Cantor's idea was, right? And in fact, that set I just mentioned, uh, we call that omega. Whoops, doesn't seem to work, yeah. So this is the set, or in technical terms, the order type, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Taken as a whole, the effect all this had, meaning the rise of abstraction, the supplementation of old concepts by new principles, the emergence of non-Euclidean geometry, the development of the mathematical concept of the infinite was that a small grain of skepticism, or perhaps not very small, implanted itself into mathematics around the middle of the 19th century. A feeling began to emerge, it really came to fruition much later, that this was the beginning of it, that certain principles may be too strong, that while the process of theorizing can certainly go on and on and on, right, this shouldn't carry us too far away from human life, from experience. Here's more of Cantor's infinite. Johann von Neumann, who made important contributions to the foundation of set theory, Cantorian set theory, expressed this thought much later in 1947, but it's a view that is, uh, would have, he would have expressed then and many express now. There's von Neumann drive. <coughs> As a mathematical discipline travels far from its empirical source, it is beset with very grave dangers. It becomes more and more purely aestheticizing, lar pour lar. Whenever this stage is reached, the only re remedy seems to be a rejuvenating return to the source 
the reinjection of more or less uh, uh, reinjection of more or less empirical ideas. <clears throat> now, von Neumann also said later uh, he said something that seems to kind of contradict about, uh, uh, this uh, about aesthetics. He wrote in a letter to Carnap in 1931, Rudolf Carnap. There's no more reason to reject intuitionism if one disregards the aesthetic issue, which in practice will also be for me the decisive factor. So he talks about lar pour lar, and on the other hand, he writes to Rudolf Carnap. By the way, whenever logicians come to visit me, I take them to the second floor of Fold and to the section where the set theory books are and the logic books are, and you can open them up, and there on the cards, you can see Rudolf Carnap, Gödel, you know, Takayuri, all these, all these people, and the explosions of glee, and people take out their iPhone and they start photographing. It's really a, a wonderful thing to do, so it's a lot of fun. So that was a Carnap. In any case, what arose at this point was a certain uh, qualm uh, about the legitimacy of mathematical methods, and that was, as I said, the more mathematics distance itself from the empirical, the weaker one's feeling of confidence in the legitimacy of methods becomes. To paraphrase the uh, German mathematician David Hilbert, facts and events don't contradict themselves, but our theories about facts and events may very well contradict themselves. <clears throat> this grain of skepticism flowered into the foundational project which came into being around the middle of the 19th century. And the idea was this. If you harbor a sense of doubt about mathematical methods, and it is important to say that this kind of reflection was indulged in only by, let us say, philosophically minded mathematicians, of which there are many, I am one, then an obvious idea will be to codify mathematical reasoning uh, to isolate a set of self-evident principles which can serve as a so-called foundation upon which to build the edifice of mathematics. So sometimes people compare this to writing down a constitution. Right? So you codify a certain uh, set of self-evident moral principles, and you call those, those laws, and then something is legal if it's not in contradiction with uh, that constitution. So for example, modus ponens will be one rule of inference, as, as we call it. Frege, Gottlob Frege, formulated a correct and adequate system of logic, and this was a great advance over what Aristotle had done. So Aristotle, great as he was, uh, he, he couldn't handle quantification, right? For every person that you know, there is a person that I know that doesn't know them, so, right? All this, we call this quantification. Aristotelian logic couldn't, couldn't handle those. But Frege gave a correct analysis of these, and in fact, his system today is the correct logical basis, regarded as such, for, for mathematics. But then Frege went further and attempted to base all of arithmetic on mere logic, so not mathematics in its full sense, right, but uh, just arithmetic. But then the worst possible thing happened with this very first codification of mathematical reasoning the system had a contradiction, and in logic, a contradiction means that you lose everything. This was a downright catastrophic turn of events, as David Hilbert called it in 1925, commenting somewhat dramatically that the foundations of mathematics were shaken before they were even built. And Hermann Weyl, member of this institute, would later coin the phrase foundational crisis to describe the series of events, namely the development of these very strong principles used in Cantorian set theory, the failures of intuition, followed by the contradiction in Frege's system. But before I talk about that, I wanted to show you part of the letter. So the contradiction was discovered by Bertrand Russell, <coughs> one of the people, rather. Uh, do I have the whole thing here? Yes. So I don't have time to read the whole thing, but it's a very polite 
letter, he says, I find in your work uh, discussions, distinctions that one seeks in vain in the work of other logicians. Uh, um, there's just one point, though, right, <laughs> where I have encountered a difficulty. And um, uh, he then proceeds to explain the contradiction. But then he tries to. Um, he, he tries to sort of repair the, the damage. I, I'm, I'm finishing a book myself, and I, I will be discussing your work very thoroughly, um, and, and so on. The, well, he says the exact treatment of logic and fundamental questions has remained very much behind. In your works, I find the best I know of our time. So what was the problem? Uh, Frege thought that every property of mathematical objects defines a set of things having that property. So, for example, the property of being even, right? You would think, well, that defines the set of even numbers, doesn't it? Well, not so fast. There's a problem there. With a little logical trickery, you can derive a paradox, and the whole system came, came crashing down. Uh, I love this letter uh, later on. Um, <clears throat> van Heyen, Jan van Heyenort uh, uh, published a collection of correspondence and essays uh, uh, in logic over the last century, kind of landmark essays. And he asked Goethe, he asked uh, Russell if he could publish his correspondence with Frege. And this is the letter that um, this is the letter that that Russell. Uh, wrote. He said, certainly, I would be pleased if you did that. Uh, I, I realize there's nothing in my knowledge to compare with Frege's dedication to truth. His entire life's work was on the verge of completion. Much of his work had been ignored to the benefit of men infinitely less capable. His second volume was about to be published. And upon finding that his fundamental assumption was an error, he responded with intellectual pleasure. So. That sets quite a high bar <laughs> for those of us who are. Uh, OK, so eventually a system was partially solved with the discovery of the correct axiom system for set theory. This was uh, by Zermelo Frankel. Set theory is called now. But Zermelo's system involved um, a kind of un unhesitating embrace of the infinite, very strong principles. Uh, so on the spectrum with empiricism on the one side and what one might call ideal mathematics on the other, the system lies well on the side of, of ideal mathematics. Hilbert, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm going to talk about the Hilbert program now. He's thought of as the last mathematician who had an overview of all of mathematics, right? Nowadays, mathematics is, consists of these specialized areas, and people can't, they can't talk to each other. It's, it's kind of a tragedy. Uh, but anyway, Hilbert is thought of as the last of the Mohicans in this respect. He was the last person who understood sort of uh, everything, the whole, the whole subject. Uh, so, so I mentioned that David Hilbert viewed the inconsistency of uh, in, in Frege's work as, as catastrophic. So he responded by setting himself the goal of establishing the certitude of mathematical methods through the mathematical analysis of proofs. So mathematicians have been proving things for thousands of years, literally. But nobody had ever thought to study proofs themselves, to turn the proof into a mathematical object of of study. So this is, what, this is what Hilbert did. The main impediment to impeaching this, to achieving the certitude as he saw it, was the concept of infinity, a concept which, though mathematics is saturated with, with it, as Hilbert said, infinity neither exists in nature nor can it serve as the basis for rational thought. So if you think of what Cantor had done, right, we certainly hope that that's a a work of a rational mind. Um, so the problem, the problem Hilbert set himself was to show that this is an idea that we can have 
faith in. And then he made this beautiful remark, um, no one shall eject us from the paradise that Cantor has created for us. So here was Hilbert's idea. You rewrite mathematics as a formal game of, of symbols, drained of content and fully mechanical. So in the actual sense that the entire thing can be mechanized, right? So you can program a computer to do it. In principle, of course, at the time there weren't any. The strange thing about the Hilbert program, as it came, came to be called, was that it was designed to restore faith, as I said, in the use of infinitistic methods. As he said, the most beautiful parts of mathematics are a veritable symphony of the infinite, as he put it. So the Hilbert program was designed to rescue this symphony from the ashes. Right? I'm, uh, I've been living in Finland for a long time, and there is a case where a symphony was thrown into the ashes. Maybe some Sibelius worked on his last symphony for many, many years, and then one day just threw it into the... <laughs> So that's probably why I have that here. Uh, so let's look at how the Hilbert School went about this. Uh, so the way he went about it was operating with the infinite can only be made certain by the finite. So you use, now whatever that means, and there's a lot of discussion about it, but you use finitary methods in order to rescue the infinite. In a way, it's kind of like killing the patient in order to save the patient, but that's another, another story. So let's look at how, how the Hilbert program did it. So he, he said, well, here's mathematics, the real part and the ideal part, or the infinitistic part. And we're going to show that actually, and the, the, techni the w technical word was conservativity, right? that anything you do with r plus i, you can do with r, the real part. Right? Contentual part is, is, is all you need. Moreover, uh, if, you, if you formulate this in an exact way, the real part, all you need is reference to the finite. There's no reference to the infinite there. So that's the Hilbert program in one drawing. <laughs> uh, so you want to prove, so the Hilbert program um, uh, made certain claims about this reconstruction. So you want to prove it's consistent, mathematics is consistent if you rebuild it in R. And you use, you prove its consistency by R methods, right? You don't go outside of R and use infinitistic. So <coughs> proof of consistency from, from the inside. And again, this idea from the inside, right? It's like a doctor, doctor healing himself or herself. Uh, so that's, that's consistency. Uh, so that's the second thing. And then third, and this is why I called my talk, uh, is mathematics a yes or no affair, right? You want to prove that in R, right, any mathematical theorem or conjecture can either be proved or refuted in this system. So you don't just mount a sort of philosophical argument why a clear mathematical conjecture has to be an answer, you actually exhibit an algorithm, a method, right? And you input, you have this method or algorithm, you input a question, and the algorithm uh, returns a yes or no answer. Yes, it's true. No, it's false. Now, different schools emerged, uh, so Brouwer, a Dutch mathematician thought reducing mathematics to a formal game of symbols was an outrage, and he's the one who actually coined the term formalism to describe the Hilbert programs. It was kind of an unfortunate term and a misunderstanding, but it's kind of stuck. Uh, so Brouwer's idea was that mathematical objects are mental objects of some sort, uh, a form of idealism which led to a drastic reduction of method in mathematics. So they're mental objects, and if you, his, his position was if you think about what that means, it means we have to reject these strong methods that uh, Zermelo's set theory encounters. 
So uh, this came to be known as intuitionism because, again, the idea was to remain in close contact with intuition or experience. There was the Vienna Circle. <coughs> so there are just a few of, few of the members. Uh, so they took the view, and there was a lot of variation of the Vienna Circle, that what's behind the apparent uh, self-evidence or a priori character of mathematics is just an idle running of language, right? That to say of the assertion two plus four, two, two plus two is four, is true. This is just to say that we've adopted a certain way of speaking, right? Certain linguistic conventions, which bestow a kind of positive value on, on such statements. And that's all there is to it, right? There's no such thing as truth or you know, these metaphysical mathematical objects, right? It's just two plus two equals four, thumbs up, good. <laughs> and that's, that's all there is to it. And I'm, I, as I said, I'm combining different, different. Uh, Poincaré and Weil propose something called predicative analysis. And then it's important to mention uh, another view within in, in foundational thinking, but also the dominant view <coughs> uh, <coughs> in the, the community of, of working mathematicians. Who needs a foundation? Mathematics doesn't need a foundation. We're doing fine, right? We're, we're not, yes, with a little bit of logical trickery, you can create paradoxes, right? You can, you can create certain logical trouble, but the bridges are staying up, right? The, the subject has not, um, the, a, a contradiction has not emerged, right, in, in, a, in a sort of genuine way. So this was, the, this was the Grundlagenstreit of the 1920s, and it was a serious dispute about the role of experience and intuition in mathematics, uh, about where the, uh, precisely the boundaries should be drawn between what is intuitively given and what lies beyond the horizon of givenness or intuition. The Streit was particularly between Hilbert and Brouwer. They had a huge fight. It led to Brouwer being thrown off the editorial board of the prestigious journal, the Annals of Mathematics. Everybody heard about, about this. In fact, when Einstein heard about the fight between Brouwer and Hilbert at the time, he said, what is this frog and mouse battle among the mathematicians? <laughs> the frog and mouse battle, that's what he, but to us who've spent our lives thinking about foundations, it's much more than a frog and mouse battle. I wonder who was the frog and who was the mouse? That's another question, I guess. Um, the argument over mathematical methods was fought par partly on philosophical terrain, mainly on mathematical terrain. What we inherited from it was the development of what we now call metamathematics, for suddenly mathematics had an ability to reflect on itself. Remember, there was this idea that a proof becomes a mathematical object, which you study with mathematical method. So suddenly mathematics had an ability to reflect on itself, to test its self-coherence, to reflect on its own use of the infinite, to test the soundness of its methods. What the Hilbert program made possible was for the entire machinery of mathematics to be turned on itself. And this is indeed a great achievement of the Grund Logenstreit, the fact that we have these beautiful methods. <clears throat> so to finish, where did this all end? Well, it hasn't really ended, but uh, the Hilbert program came to an end. So did Hilbert succeed? And the answer is no, because of Gödel. So, a young student and very quiet observer of the scene, student of Hans Hahn at the University of Vienna, uh, of Vienna, and sometime casual visitor to the Vienna Circle, proved a very subtle theorem in his 1929 doctoral thesis called the Completeness Theorem, which showed that, in some sense, the finite and the infinite are in a perfect balance with each other. That's one way of describing. I said he was a casual visitor to the Vienna Circle, but he made it very clear for the rest of his life and very emphatically that he did not agree with this idea of conventionalism and, and, and so forth. <clears throat> and then, so he proved this theorem in his thesis that the infinite and the finite are in this beautiful balance with each other. And then in 1930, Gödel dealt a death blow 
to the Hilbert program with his two incompleteness theorems, so published in 1931, but announced in 1930, theorems which caught the attention of the whole world, so not just within mathematics. So putting the theorems in plain language, this is what the theorems say. Mathematics cannot be mechanized. Infinitistic concepts cannot be eliminated in the way Hilbert proposed, or in any other way for that matter. In particular, the concept of truth, mathematical truth, right, that's a very heavy concept, cannot be replaced by the concept of proof, never mind finite proof, right? That's another way of saying what Hilbert wanted to do. <clears throat> and I, I love the way, I love this way of formulating um, the meaning of the incompleteness here. The view that mathematics is an empty formalism which can be adjoined to the factual sciences with no extra addition of content cannot be shown. So I thought I would leave discussion of the incompleteness theorems to the question and answer period. I will say that Gödel spent the rest of his life defending the use of infinitary methods and also to formulating a, a positive position, what mathematics is, what mathematical truth is. So notice these three are all uh, negations, right? These are all negative uh, statements, but he wanted a positive position. Um, never succeeded in doing that, but of course left us a tremendous nachlas um, uh, of, of writings on um, the question. So uh, what about today? The Grundlagenstreit has by no means been resolved. Versions of Hilbert's, Frege's, and Brouwer's platforms, so that is to say research programs built on the idea of eliminating reference to suspect objects and two strong principles, are very much going concerns. In fact, um, there was a special year in 2012 and 13 uh, in the School of Mathematics here devoted to the work of, of Vladimir Volvodsky, which is very much built on what Brouwer had, had done. I should also say, that right, the incompleteness theorems do show that mathematics cannot be mechanized right, in one go, but large portions of it locally. Right? You can take care of large portions of it. You can't do the whole thing at once. So uh, on the other side of things, mathematicians who work on Cantorian set theory have made spectacular progress in understanding the nature of the infinite, emboldened perhaps by Gödel's recommendation that not just the small infinite, as we call it, but also the very far reaches of the infinite will fall under the knife of mathematical analysis, just as so much else has. And in fact, the structure of infinity, so there's a structure that's emerging, um, manifests a powerful in internal coherence. It's a vision of great beauty, and mathematicians continue continue to, to be drawn to it. So these, these are the two sides and the main dilemma. And though they may not be at each other's throats as they were in the days of the frog and mouse battle, there's, there's still a lot of contentious debate and, and work to be done. I have to say, for many of us, Gödel is an absolute beacon guiding and directing the field. And Gödel is even a signpost. <laughs> so, Thank you.